The Zelda series is pretty massive, a saga spanning well over 30 years of some of the best loved titles in video game history. There's a lot to these games, and a huge amount of work goes into their development. The process from concept to completion is incredibly long and tedious. This means that there's a lot left on the table. Unused assets, concepts, music, even story elements which never made it into the completed games. I've previously covered some of my favourite unused ideas from Zelda games, but today, let's run through some unused content which still exists in the files of these games. So subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content, and from forgotten attacks to a strange feature of Breath of the Wild's Master Sword, let's run through some unused content. Of all Link's moves, save for his signature spin attack, none are more iconic than the Sword Beam. This technique first appeared in the very first game in the series, when, at full health, Link is able to throw a projection of his sword with every swing, giving him an incredibly effective ranged attack with unlimited ammunition up until the moment he takes damage. This ability carried over into Adventure of Link, A Link to the Past, and Link's Awakening too, functioning pretty much the same way as it did in the original. Even now, decades later, the Sword Beam endures as one of Link's classic moves, featuring heavily in Skyward Sword, known as the Skyward Strike, and most recently in Breath of the Wild, as a feature of the Master Sword. The beam has even been introduced to Link's Smash Ultimate moveset, fittingly only usable when Link has taken no damage. However, the Sword Beam is notably absent from perhaps the most iconic game in the series, Ocarina of Time. But this wasn't always the case. In some early pre-release screenshots, we can see Link performing the Sword Beam. For whatever reason, this ability was cut from the game late into development, making its debut in 3D instead in the game's sequel, Majora's Mask. But remnants of this technique still exist in the game's files, with multiple restoration projects having taken place to try and get the move to function. The beam was first discovered by Dark Link 77, who, as far as I know, managed to get the attack's animation to play instead of a large spin attack. This was later improved upon by Sakura89 and Spinout, though it's still missing a lot of its functionality. It's unclear why the Sword Beam was cut from Ocarina of Time. Perhaps the team had difficulty getting the move to function in a 3D environment, or perhaps the beam was considered too powerful, and other ranged options like the bow or slingshot were preferred. Either way, it's great that we can still see parts of this lost move in the game's files. From the alien Shadow Beasts to the monstrous Stalord, it's difficult to argue against the opinion that Twilight Princess's enemy design is among the best in the series. Visually intimidating, unique, and often characterful monsters. I've previously covered Twilight Princess's Cut Moblin, a nightmarish beast with large, pointed teeth, and the strange, semi-functional Armos Titan, a mechanical foe which looks like it was intended to appear in the Temple of Time in another video. But there's a cut monster I didn't cover, the bizarre Goron Golem. The Goron Golem initially appears just as a group of regular Gorons, curled up on the floor. But when approached, things get strange. The Gorons float, packing together into the shape of a large humanoid. This conglomerate Goron then walks around, holding its hands up in a fighting stance, and is able to swipe at Link. After some time, the Goron may disassemble back into the group, who can walk about independently, but before long, the Gorons curl up, once more forming the Golem. What this weird formation was meant to be used for is unclear, though wrestling is a somewhat large part of the Goron's storyline in the game. Link must defeat Gorkoron using the Iron Boots, and later both Dangoro and Phyrus inside the mines itself using a similar sort of combat. Perhaps the Goron Golem was somehow connected to sumo wrestling, or was a scrapped idea for Phyrus. We'll never know for sure, but the enemy remains in the game's files. Jaboon has somewhat of a strange role in The Wind Waker, owing largely to the game's shortened development time. He's the Water Spirit, the third in a trio of Guardian Deities, alongside Valu, Spirit of the Skies, and the Great Deku Tree, Spirit of the Earth. After Link obtains both Din's Pearl and Farrell's Pearl from Dragon Roost Island and Forest Haven respectively, he travels to what we're led to believe will be a third elemental dungeon, found on Greatfish Isle. 
However, instead, Link is met with a ruin. Great Fish Isle has been torn asunder, the earth shattered and broken, caught in a perpetual thunderstorm. This, of course, was the work of Ganondorf. Though the water spirit narrowly escaped to Outset Island, sealed in a secret cavern where Link can find him and obtain the Nehru's Pearl, without having to complete a dungeon. Many believe this is where one of the Wind Waker's infamous missing dungeons would have taken place, though due to time issues during development, no such dungeon exists. After this brief meeting, Jaboon doesn't really play a role in the story, but this might not have always been the case. Found in the game's files are two audio clips, assigned to Jaboon, which go unused. The first appears to be the fish laughing, possibly used when he first appeared, but the second is a harrowing scream. Coupled with an unused swimming animation for Jaboon, these hint at a scrapped larger role for him in the game, one which, judging from the terrifying scream sound effect, may not have ended well for the deity. The Minish Cap's music is among the best in 2D Zelda, capturing brilliantly every emotion the game wants you to feel, from the bright, jovial Hyrule Town, to the mysterious Minish Woods and the dark, unsettling Royal Valley. Players can actually listen to the game's soundtrack in the Phonograph House, found in Hyrule Town, which is inaccessible until Link collects every figurine in the game. Once this is done, Link will receive the Karlov Medal, allowing access to the house, which includes a piece of heart, multiple chests, and the sound test. From here, it's possible to play every song the player has heard so far in their adventure, which is a brilliant secret unlock for those who go out of their way to collect every figurine. However, strangely, Song 6 on the sound test isn't actually heard anywhere in the game. It's a version of the intro theme from A Link to the Past, which plays on the game's title screen. There's another interesting track which doesn't appear in the game, though it can't be accessed even through this sound test room. It's a version of Ocarina of Time's Lost Woods theme, though notably it's the version which plays during the game's credits. Why either of these tracks are found in the Minish Cap is unclear. Perhaps the game was originally intended to have the same theme as A Link to the Past on its title screen, or have the Lost Woods theme play in the Minish Woods. But regardless of why they appear, it's neat to hear these classic songs in the Minish Cap style. The Master Sword's appearance in Breath of the Wild has become one of the most iconic depictions of the legendary blade. Tied to the hero's fate, the blade was heavily damaged during the Great Calamity, rusted and chipped, and laid to rest for a century in the Korok Forest by Princess Zelda. The Master Sword is one of the best single-handed weapons in the game. In the presence of malice, such as within Divine Beasts, Hyrule Castle, or against Guardians, the blade glows with holy might doubling its attack power and increasing its durability. This power can be made permanent by completing the Trial of the Sword, meaning the blade is always in its awakened state. However, despite being the legendary sword that seals the darkness, the Master Sword can still break, like every other weapon in Breath of the Wild. Though, instead of shattering like lesser blades, the Master Sword instead simply runs out of energy, rendering it unusable for a few minutes. It's unclear though if this was always intended to be the case. There might have been an alternate design for the Master Sword's power depletion. There's an unused animation which still exists in the game. This animation can be triggered easily if the player tricks the game into believing they have dropped the Master Sword, which can be done by overloading the game's memory. A simple way to do this is to hoard around six multi-shot bows, then one by one equip and drop them while they have shock arrows knocked, just like I'm doing on screen. Eventually, things will get pretty buggy, with Link becoming a... floating head. 
This allows us to trick the game into thinking we're still holding the Master Sword, while actually holding something we can drop. Dropping this weapon, and then unpausing, will trigger this animation. The Master Sword, engulfed in a bright blue light, flies upwards, spinning as it goes, while the text, The Master Sword Has Returned to the Forest, appears on screen. Of course, our Master Sword hasn't actually returned to the forest as we dropped a different weapon. It's possible that this is a failsafe, in case someone accidentally found a way to drop their Master Sword so that they could reobtain it from the Korok Forest. But I think it's more likely that this was intended to be the way that the Master Sword ran out of energy. Once the game believes that Link no longer has it, an animation plays suggesting that he should return to the forest to claim it once more. Breath of the Wild's weapon-breaking mechanic is already somewhat tedious at times, so I'm glad we don't have to trek to the Korok Forest every time the Master Sword's energy runs low, but I love that we can still see this unused animation in-game. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.